Um, so now you all know we're being recorded. Uh, yeah, thank you so much for coming and welcome. Um, I'm Sean Evans, the Information Literacy and Instructional Design Librarian at Maryland Institute College um, of Art. Um, Art in the Archive is a conversation series that is going to explore the role of the archive in the arts and cultural production. Um, so attendees can expect a lively, expansive discussion of how archives unfold in our everyday lives. Um, so today in this inaugural session, we're going to explore the question, um, what is an archive? Um, over the past 50 years, the archive has been unpacked, um, repositioned and reimagined in contemporary art, literature, theory and information science. Um, and in this conversation, we invite two um, artists, a researcher and a librarian to explore this very question through the lens of their practice. Um, so each speaker will present for roughly 10 minutes after, um, after I introduce them. Um, and after which we will hold a facilitated discussion. So at that time, um, we are going to welcome you to ask questions in the chat or to use the raise the hand function in Zoom um, so you can be called upon. Um, please do keep your questions brief um, if you're um, speaking out loud up to uh, 30 seconds or so, just to make sure there's ample time for our speakers to respond to any questions that do arise. Um, and I wanna thank as well, um, the Art History Department, the Humanistic Studies Department, Strategic Initiatives, and the Space for Creative Black Imagination for co-sponsoring um, this event. Um, I'm going to, in a moment, um, post a link to our code of conduct in the chat. Um, and But just so you know, um, we are dedicated to providing a harassment-free event experience for everyone, regardless of any vector of identity. Um, so we will not tolerate harassment in any form um, and as I said, in a moment, I will uh, post that link into the chat. Um, if you give me one second. And so here is the link. Um, to that code of conduct. So I'm gonna go ahead and, um, and get started. Um, as you can see, um, we are going to kind of work through this question. And we are actually gonna start um, with our first speaker who I'm gonna turn it over to in just a second. I'm really excited to introduce you all um, to my um, wonderful colleague, uh, Jennifer A. Ferretti, um, who is an artist and the digital initiatives librarian at Maryland Institute College of Art on Piscataway land in Baltimore, Maryland. She is a first generation American Latina mestiza whose librarianship is guided by critical praxis, not neutrality. As a MICA alum, her work as a librarian focuses on reframing the conversation around research and information literacy from a non-traditional discipline perspective exploring non-Western forms of knowledge making and sharing and emphasizing art is information. Jennifer is also the founder and principal of We Here, a community and business that seeks to support library and archive workers who identify as black, indigenous and people of color. It was, which was created in 2016 in response to the overwhelming and historical legacy of whiteness in library and information science professions. So with that, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen and turn it over to Jenny to get us started. Thanks, Sean. So Sean, if you can just give me a uh, visual thumbs up and everything once I, oops, this is not asking me which, yes it did, okay, cool. Make sure that everything is working right, that you can hear me, that you can see my slides, everything. Okay, yay, thank you. Okay. So hi everyone, thank you so much for being here. It feels really good to be with you all this evening. I'm a librarian at Micah Stecker Library and I'm Micah Photography alum. If you ever had me in one of your classes, you might remember that I also introduced myself as previously having been an archivist. I believe the embodiment of the archive goes well beyond the Western tradition, but today I'm gonna to be talking about archival theory and the archive profession from a Western perspective, but also want to acknowledge the existence and value of non-Western forms of knowledge-making 
and preservation. So I would like to start my presentation with this quote from Michelle Caswell. It's a little long, so I apologize. The archive has been deconstructed, decolonized, and queered by scholars in fields as wide ranging as English, anthropology, cultural studies, and gender and ethnic studies. Yet almost none of the humanistic inquiry at the archival turn, even that which addresses actually existing archives, has acknowledged the intellectual contribution of archival studies as the field of theory and practice, praxis in its own right, nor is this humanities scholarship in conversation with ideas, debates, and lineages in archival studies. In essence, the humanities scholarship is suffering from a failure of interdisciplinarity when it comes to archives. Basically, Michelle Caswell is discussing the erasure of archival theory and essentially the archivist from the archive discussion. From a personal perspective, if erasure isn't happening, it may be, it may be more like reduction of archival theory and praxis to service similar to what happens to librarians. So archive, noun and verb, is a word I've heard repeatedly in many art and design environments without much discussion of the meaning, traditionally or personally. The humanities and the archives field are generally not speaking and benefiting from each other, and I would say the same for the art and design field. A student and I were talking about this recently, and they'll remain anonymous because I didn't get permission to share, and they said it reminds them of how people talk about curating. It seems everyone's a curator and everyone is curating lately. For the archivist, the feelings are similar as the profession has standards and best practices, parlance and vocabulary, theory, publications, and professional organizations. Perhaps this is a result of what I like to call the information studies PR problem. People do not know what we do, which often leads to things like complete erasure and reduction as mentioned before, or fetishizing of our profession. So that we're on the same page, I'll briefly give some definitions. So archives in the institutional and traditional sense are materials created or received by a person, family, or organization, public or private, in the conduct of their affairs and preserved because of the enduring value contained in the information they contain or as evidence of the functions and responsibilities of their creator. So for example, New York Public Library holds the New York Times company records, which has things like reports, scrapbooks, court records, et cetera, as well as collections like the James Baldwin papers, which holds early writings, letters, and documents collected by his estate. Archives in the Western tradition were developed for government records as a means to keep the government accountable. Archives is also the word to describe a physical space slash organization that houses these collections. Archivists are people who work in archives, who organize, preserve, and provide access to archives. This in practice is archival science. American archivists were traditionally trained within history programs, but after a few decades, more and more, these programs are found within information studies. Those who explore professional practice typically have a master's degree or doctorate. Oops, there we go. No. Working with archives as an uncredentialed person fresh out of undergrad is what convinced me to go to graduate school for my master's degree in library and information science. And Micah is the reason I began working with archives. As a Micah photography student, I had to complete an internship in order to graduate. So I did mine at the Maryland Historical Society, which is now called the Maryland Center for History and Culture, that, or MCHC. MCHC takes up one entire city block in Mount Vernon and consists of a library and museum. They have both special collections materials where archives are housed and museum items. The internship turned into a part-time job. And after working two part-time jobs simultaneously, I successfully lobbied for a full-time position at the Historical Society. Their collections at the very least doubled when they acquired the Peel Museum slash Baltimore City Life Museum's collections when this museum closed in the 1990s. The acquisition consisted of processed and unprocessed material, the latter meaning they are not ready for patron use because they have not been arranged, arranged described and properly housed. And they did not acquire any additional staff on a permanent basis. Part of that acquisition included the unprocessed Paul Henderson photograph collection, which consists of over 7,000 negatives and a few hundred prints. While unprocessed, a couple images had been handpicked from the collection and provided to anyone who wanted to purchase them to include in books, television, et cetera. Henderson's photogra photographs depicted Baltimore's black community from roughly the late 1930s through mid 1960s. As an Afro-American newspaper photographer and freelancer, Henderson's subjects included nightclubs and entertainment, 
formal portraits, politicians, Morgan State University and Bowie State University, NAACP activities and protests and so much more. The institution either lacked the interest or skills necessary to process this incredible collection. I started my three year journey with it in 2009 when I became hyper focused on making it available to the public. I processed it along with help from a Towson University class, curated an exhibition for which I was not only the curator, but the graphic designer, website developer, and I co-planned a panel discussion on the topic of Maryland's civil rights era to happen the same night as the exhibition opening. I even had to paint the gallery walls myself because the institution wouldn't provide professional painters. I was a 20 something year old, barely making $30,000. I was not given the institutional support beyond permission and a very small budget compared to other exhibitions. It's unfortunate to say this, but the institution's treatment is not exactly unique. To put this work on one person without the proper support and then reap the benefits is something we must recognize is normalized in these types of institutions. Similar to the library and information science profession, the demographics of the museum history and culture professions are not only overwhelmingly white, but they are overwhelmingly homogenous. People of similar class and educational backgrounds who went to the same few programs and did the same types of unpaid internships fill these positions. There's a significant barrier to entry in these professions. You would have to be familiar with the profession somehow. I always say I never wanted to be a librarian because I didn't know what librarians did. Master's programs are costly and permanent jobs are few. The homogeneity at some institutions is reflected in what is collected and deemed of value. The exhibitions, programming, hiring process, basically every piece of the structure of these institutions. As a response to the call to become more inclusive, some institutions are funding and creating community-driven archives like Preserve the Baltimore Uprising Archive Project, where anyone can submit anything related to the Baltimore Uprising and police brutality in Baltimore. There are people who are actively working to change institutions at the local, national, and global level who might work in the profession, but are organizing outside of it. For example, the Blackivists, a collective of trained Black archivists who prioritize Black cultural heritage, preservation, and memory work. Archivistas in Espanglish is a collective of, of transnational Latin American and Latinx archivists and cultural workers that aims to incubate and amplify spaces of memory building within Las Americas. Documenting the now, made up of not just archivists, but also activists and researchers, develops tools and builds community practices that support the ethical collection, use, and preservation of social media content. Other, other methods of interrogation of archives by information professionals includes publications, presentations, and conferences, and a growing scholarship on critical archival studies and a call for dismantling white supremacy in archives. Outside of the formal profession, and in my opinion, in their own way, and perhaps unknowingly, working to change the profession by showing people their identities, their culture are of value and deserve to be preserved, are digital archives online, like Black Archives, whose mission is to give voice to those undertold, those stories undertold, while providing authentic representation and inspiration to transformative growth of Black people everywhere. Laurel's history a visual journal, journal and love letter to Baltimore, to Black Baltimore's history, and Map Points, a 90s Southern California subculture archive. Leaving the archive to the institutions can sometimes also mean erasure, particularly of marginalized communities. If an inexperienced person like myself hadn't made the Henderson Collection a focus in my work, where would it be today? If Dion Moses, fellow panelist, hadn't developed the Maryland Institute Black Archives, would the MICA community and the public know as much about MICA's history and racial past as we do now? Traditionally, it is not the job of the archivists to interpret a collection that is left to curators, researchers, et cetera, but who are these institutions bringing in to do this work? Perhaps this very interrogation might help with erasure on both sides. So I'll end with this quote from the book, Dispossessed Lives, Enslaved Women, Violence in the Archive by Manisha J. Fuentes. The archive conceals, distorts, and silences as much as it reveals. Thank you, gracias. Thank you so much, Jenny. That was a wonderful way to get us started. Um, so I'm gonna just move on to each presentation and we'll do questions and discussion at the end. Um, but yeah, I encourage you to do the little hand claps icon if you want um, to let Jenny know how great that was. 
Um, so I'm going to go ahead and share my screen again and introduce our next speaker. So our next speaker is um, Ashley Minner, who is a community based visual artist from Baltimore, Maryland, and an enrolled member of the Lumbee tribe of North Carolina. She received her MFA and MA in Community Arts and her BFA in General Fine Arts from Maryland Institute College of Art. She recently earned her PhD in American Studies from University of Maryland College Park. Re very recently, congratulations. <laughs> um, Ashley works as a professor of the practice and folklorist in the Department of American Studies at the University of Maryland, Baltimore County, where she also serves as director of the minor in public humanities. Her current research focuses on the Lumbee Indian community of East Baltimore. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and uh, introduce Ashley, stop sharing, and you can take it away, Ashley. All right. One second. Okay, can everybody see my screen and hear me? Cool. Um, it's such an honor to be with you this evening. Thank you again for having me. I'm going to talk a little bit about um, how my artistic practice has come to encompass archival research. So um, we're, I'm speaking to you tonight from the ancestral homeland of the Piscataway, but also the Susquehannock Indians, and this was brought to light again recently through archival research. A scholar, Emma Bielski, um, tapped someone at the Maryland State Archives who re-uncovered re this document. It's actually the treaty um, whereby the Susquehannock ceded the land that would become Baltimore and some more to the colony of Maryland in 1652. I, of course, as Sean mentioned, I'm a member of the Lumbee tribe of North Carolina, and I'm, our tribe is not indigenous to Maryland. We come from um, the southern part of North Carolina that 95 runs right through it, and we take our name from the Lumbee River, which uh, looks a lot like this. This is it. And what doesn't look like the river in the swamp looks a lot like this. It's a rural place, um, and I took this picture of a field of tobacco a couple years ago. This is a picture of my mom and my uncle um, standing by one of their fields when they were kids and just not too much has changed since then. Um, my grandparents generation found, many of them found themselves sharecropping on their tribal homeland and so they left North Carolina and moved to industrial centers like Baltimore where they could have better opportunities and um, employment in factories, which was much easier and afforded a better lifestyle. And they settled in an area bridging the neighborhoods of Upper Fells Point and Washington Hill by the thousands um, following World War II. So when my mom was a little kid and Baltimore is the largest uh, satellite community of Lumbee Indians outside of North Carolina today. Although we did have um, ancestors who came prior to that time, like Governor Worth Locklear, who was an 1893 graduate of Baltimore University Schools of Medicine, which is today known as Johns Hopkins University. And archival research re revealed that Governor Worth Locklear is actually my great grandfather's uncle by marriage. So it kind of feeds into what we know about how our communities operate, we send for relatives and we depend on the experiences of relatives in places far away from home to know that we'll be okay. So Lumbee folks settled basically in an area around South Broadway and East Baltimore Street, that intersection, and here are some Lumbee ladies at the Latrobe Monument, probably in the 1940s. And the first thing they did was establish a church, um, which wasn't always in this building, but it was in my lifetime the Baltimore American Indian Center. And that's where I spent a lot of time growing up and working with young people as an artist and, you know, just being a person in my community. And in our lifetimes, mine and those kids, we knew that we had the church, the Indian Center, the Indian Center had this daycare on Lombard. And then we also had 
stories of places that were gone before our time, such as the volcano bar that used to be at the intersection of Fairmont Avenue and Ann Street. And if you go there now, it's so thoroughly erased, you can't even tell what corner it would have been on. But one thing I did with the young people I worked with often was walk the neighborhood and reassure them that they belong there as much as anybody because society has a way of convincing um, folks who they deem racially ambiguous that they don't belong. And one thing we always knew was that we're following in the footsteps of those who came before us. So if you notice that filigree, we're standing just about where these ladies were um, 50 years later. So one day I was trying to give a walking tour of the few sites I knew from my own lifetime in the community. And we started at the church. And on that day, one of my elders, Sister Linda Cox was with me and she stopped us just a few feet away from the church out front of El Salvador restaurant and said, wait, don't you wanna tell these people about the Indian store that used to be here? And I was like, I, you know, I can't, it, it was gone before my lifetime. I didn't even know we had a store right here. And that sent me down the rabbit hole of trying to figure out what businesses and community centers and places we used to have in the community that no longer exist today and why. So I found this 1969 map of our community that had a couple places that did not survive into my lifetime. And I got really excited and I took it to my elders and I was like, look, I found a map of your community. They were not excited. They said the map was all wrong. Um, and I asked if they could fix it. They couldn't. And instead they turned it over and started mapping their own, uh, they made their own map from memory. And then um, you can see like just how much information is conveyed in the different blocks that they, that they conjured just from the archives of their shared experiences. So we went through a couple rounds of mapping and also walking the community to point to places where we've literally inscribed ourselves in the neighborhood and also to places where there's not much left to see. And you see that that green block, the Betty Hyatt Community Park, that's actually the 1700 block of East Baltimore Street, which was the heart of what we used to call the reservation where all these thousands of Lumbee Indians lived. And it was wiped out through urban renewal. And so then I began, um, going to archives all over trying to corroborate the stories that the elders were telling me about the reservation of their youth and seeing how it fits in with the community I grew up in, you know, from 1983 on. So I found quite a bit at the downtown Enoch Pratt, at Baltimore City Archives, um, and different archives are, feel differently about the preciousness of their materials. Some will, um, you know, tell you about how you should handle things. Others are more like have at it. I found images of our community leaders in the Baltimore News American archives down at College Park. Um, news stories about, you know, for example, that park where the 1700 block of houses used to be is now called the Betty Hyatt Park. Well, this is a picture of Betty Hyatt and it also includes Rosie Hunt, who was a co-founder of the Baltimore American Indian Center, which suggests to me that they were working together on trying to save the neighborhood. Um, and I didn't know that. I found my husband's grandmother. Um, I found other people's grandmothers. I found the bouncer of the volcano, which is that bar that was at the corner of Fairmont and Ann Street. And I actually found the only picture I've ever seen of the volcano to date in the Afro and this is a photo of a man who was actually assaulted at the volcano during the um, uprising following the assassination of Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. And that's, you know, what we have right now. Um, CHAP, the Commission for Historical and Architectural Preservation, ironically took pictures of all the houses that were raised prior to them being raised. So now we have images of East Baltimore Church of God. Look at all them Indians on East Baltimore Street. Um, the Moonlight Restaurant, which was super important to us. The daycare used to be a blood bank, who knew? Uh, Sid's Ranch House Tavern is now gone. It's now this green space. And I actually found the first image of it in a book of Baltimore's old movie theaters because prior to being Sid's Ranch House, the bar, it was a movie theater. And then I'll just give you two short stories about uh, what, what it's meant to be in conversation with archives through this process. One is, this is the McKim Center way up on East Baltimore Street. 
And in 1957, Ebony Magazine sent a photographer out to a youth social dance that was taking place at the McKim Center and um, the, with the purpose of documenting Lumbee Indian youth. They were like this new strange population in the city where you could be black or white. And um, my, I recognized my Aunt Jeanette in the article right away. She's to the right in the center with her hand on her hip. And she was just 14 years old when this picture was taken. And then later she shows up in this article, which was by all accounts offensive, but um, actually ended up being, you know, what we, the images we have of the reservation during this era today. Now, uh, I was able to locate the actual magazine itself online and buy it and bring it home to Antoinette. And she was just like thrilled to see herself again and see, you know, her, her age mates there. But um, the photograph itself is still tied up in archives. It's, it's now been accessioned by the Smithsonian. Who knows when we'll ever be able to see it. And then furthermore, Antoinette and I visited the McKim Center. And as soon as we got there, she remembered where she was standing, where the photographer was, who she was with. 60 years later, like all the memory was re, re evoked. Um, and the last thing I'll share with you, this is uh, the mother of Tammy Hale. Uh, another Lumbee Indian woman from the community, and she posted this picture in her mother's honor the other day. I recognized the headband from one of the News American photos, and this is Tammy as a child wearing it. And I was like, oh, hey, I, I know that headband. Look at this picture. And she said, oh, did they have any more images from that same shoot? And I was like, well, Tammy, they just had a couple more of uh, Kirby Locklear dancing. I don't think it's probably anything you're looking for. And she saw this image and she said, yes, that's what I'm looking for because those are my mom's feet. And my mom never danced, but she did that day. So she, she really wanted this image of her mom's feet and it was in the archives and nobody knew that. And I certainly wouldn't have known to grab it. So um, part of the thing I'm so fired up about right now is that these materials belong in places where our people can access them. Um, I've been working with the archivists at UMBC to accession all the research I've done and then also, you know, all the things I found one way or another make a way because our, our people will not go to College Park and Baltimore City Archives and maybe not even to UMBC. We're trying to break down barriers so that they'll come and um, know that they're welcome. You know, it's a publicly accessible collection. I saw Lindsay Lapers in the audience, so shout out to her for being so awesome. And this is an article I recently co-authored with another Lumbee scholar, Jessica Markey Locklear, who does similar work with the Lumbee community up in Philly. And we just talk about how important it is for people to be able to um, access our cultural information and our history you know, while, while they're with us. And then after they're gone to how quickly the oral histories, for example, and the, and the pictures of people become precious as they pass. And if anybody wants to reach out to me, here's my information. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, that's amazing. Yeah, I see a lot of hand claps. Um, feel free to also, I should have mentioned this earlier, but anybody feel free to post, um, you know, questions or comments in the chat. We'll try and get to them later. But if things come up um, during people's talks, please feel free to, to use that as well. Um, so I'm going to move us right along and uh, introduce our next speaker. Um, and let's see who is Dr. Mel Lewis, um, who is the Chair of Humanistic Studies um, and the, uh, the founding co-director of the Space for Creative Black Imagination and Associate Professor of Black and Ethnic Studies and Gender and Sexuality Studies at Maryland Institute College of Art. Their research and teaching cultivates Black, queer, critical race, social justice pedagogies for liberatory art and design education and creative practice. Dr. Mel's personal, professional, and political commitments are to overlapping and interlocking queer, trans, non-binary, intersex, and feminist communities of color. Originally from Bayou Labatre, I think I messed that up even though I asked, <laughs> Alabama, their creative work explores queer of color themes in rural coastal settings. Um, so with that, I'm gonna pass it over to Dr. Mel. 
Thank you so much. Hey, y'all. Um, I'm so honored to be a part of this conversation. So thank you, Sean, for uh, gathering us all. And thank you, Jennifer and Ashley and Dion, um, for our, our conversation this evening. Um, so I'll go ahead and share my screen. And we'll add captioning and also recording. All right. Um, so I'd like to talk a little bit um, about Black queer memory as archive. And I'm not an archivist, um, but uh, I know and love many of them. So. Um, I am a Black queer studies and Black feminist studies scholar, uh, researcher, and pedagogue, uh, and I teach at those intersections. So I enter this conversation um, asking, how do we teach and use the archive? And how does the archive live in our classrooms? And how do Black queer voices uh, emerge from the archive uh, in the work of students, uh, not only on, in our own research, but uh, in the work of students. So I'll introduce here um, from my archive, this was my flyer for the um, spring 2020 uh, course, Queer Memory. And the class was interrupted, um, but I'm excited to revisit it um, at this time. Um, so in the course, Queer Memory, uh, we were exploring who tells queer stories uh, and how are those stories told. And we we're also uncovering uh, memories from the margins. Um, so uh, that interfaces with a lot of the things um, that Ashley has said and Jennifer has said um, in terms of um, being critical uh, of archives as well as um, uh, helping voices to emerge from the archive. Um, and this course did have an emphasis on the intersections of race, socioeconomic class, um, gender and sexuality. Um, and we were looking at queer icons um, and also lesser known figures um, as we explored the um, uh, materials. So we were using primary source documents, um, autobiographical uh, literature and uh, film photos, um, and these raise the questions for me, uh, what is the archive and what is in the archive? So those are the questions we'll uh, explore this evening. So um, I'll start here with Colin Prescott's um, question or call to action, um, thinking of the archive as reparative history. So Prescott says um, and challenges archivists to understand the issue, not as the need to simply include a black experience. And here we're talking about um, the intersections of race and sexuality in terms of black queerness, but also to allow for black agency in the making of the record. And so um, here I've used uh, the example uh, of Baird Rustin. We have a, a photo here. This is from the Library of Congress collection. And we may know Baird Rustin um, as a, a civil rights figure and or we may know um, Baird Rustin as um, a, an LGBT rights figure uh, or we may not know Rustin at all. Um, so in Rustin's example, and uh, we spent some time with him in our class and some of the archival materials, um, we are thinking about Rustin through this lens of reparative history. So for instance, we have records on Rustin um, that are about um, morals charges, um, that are arrest records for lewd behavior, um, and these are the public records that are available. Um, so we might want to take that context and bring it into um, the question of reparative history. 
Um, if those are the materials that are available about Rustin's life, how do we then um, uh, ask him to emerge um, and reveal himself to us as uh, a civil rights leader um, and as an LGBT rights leader? Um, so when we think about uh, folks that we may now describe as lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, or queer uh, from the past, um, we also might think about the less robust uh, records of that community. Um, where are the records of community celebrations? Uh, where are the records of love affairs and longstanding relationships? Um, where are the records of chosen family and events and merriment of daily life? Um, so when we think about um, the, the records that are available to us, um, we know Rustin as an unapologetically black gay man who engaged in both gay rights activism and civil rights activism and is in fact the architect of the March on Washington for Jobs and Freedom uh, in 1963 and senior advisor to Martin Luther King who truly introduced him to and mentored him in nonviolent protest. So we know that Rustin has been um, uh, erased from some of the Black civil rights um, materials in terms of the archive and the way we articulate that history uh, because of his sexuality. And we also know that anti-Blackness -black uh, has played a role in um, recognizing uh, his participation in early uh, LGBT rights. Um, and so those are some of the questions about what is in the archive? What do we do when folks' histories um, are, uh, are in the period were meant to be hidden, were meant to be um, um, something that folks were not able to access? Uh, how do we then elicit that um, from the history now? Um, also in exploring the archive, Let's see, um, I was doing this work on Rustin and I went to the DC Public Library's archives, the People's Archive. And uh, Rustin has a story here on page two of the Women in the Life magazine. And in this uh, questioning of what is in the archive, I found Rustin, but I also found myself. So you'll see me uh, the eye of inside, um, that's me there. Um, the I and the N are kind of over my face and chin. Um, in 2003, this is my uh, mid twenties club going experience. So as we think about what is in the archive, um, we also might want to think both figuratively and literally uh, about finding ourselves. So in that experience of finding myself in the archive, um, I wanted to also add um, Svetkovich's uh, archive of feelings. So this is another way of understanding what is the archive. Um, and understanding gay and lesbian and later LGBTQ archives as archives of emotion and trauma helps us to explain some of their idiosyncrasies or one might say their queerness. So when we are thinking about that process of queering the archives and interpreting and reinterpreting, reading into and eliciting, um, these are some of the processes that we are going through. Uh, and it's not just the very technical uh, history of dates and times and locations, but we also have the archive of feelings. So in recognizing this cover um, and some, my friends in my mid twenties uh, and this celebration of DC Black Pride, um, what does that elicit? That's, that's very different from the hung jury as a nightclub, as a space or place, um, or DC Black, Black Pride as a particular date on the calendar. Um, so here we're thinking not only about um, the emotion, but also about how um, recognizing uh, emotion and kind of those ephemeral moments leads us in a different direction from this very technical understanding of the archive. Also, when we're thinking about what is the archive and what is in the archive, 
um, we might want to think a little bit about questions and other knowledges. So here I'm, I'm drawing on Amanda Anderson's work uh, from a Black feminist perspective. Um, and this is a photo uh, from the Schomburg and this is uh, Lorraine Hansberry. And you may know her as the author of A Raisin in the Sun. And so Anderson says the objective of a question that destabilizes knowledge is not to just move past the question or to provide a single solution, but rather to make room for other questions, other knowledges, and to ludicate how they unsettle notions of truth and certainty. So here in the example uh, of Lorraine Hansberry, uh, in the Schomburg, um, uh, text here, we see she is named a dramatist. And because we know uh, her as the author of A Raisin in the Sun, uh, that is clear and accurate. We may know her as a, a Black woman writer uh, in, in a particular tradition. And so knowing her and her work uh, in this way through the Schomburg's um, collection is um, one way of knowing um, and, and we might ask another question. So here we have um, the publication, The Ladder. And this is uh, the front cover of a 1956 issue. And The Ladder is among the earliest lesbian publications in the US. And this, is, this collection is held um, at the USC libraries. So we have two separate collections um, both containing the work of Lorraine Hansberry. So we may know Hansberry as a Black author, a Black woman author, um, but do we also know her uh, as um, someone who's published letters on what we would now describe as intersectionality uh, in the latter? Uh, which is one of the earliest lesbian publications, as I've said here. So these questions about who lives in what archive um, and where the two shall meet, uh, in this case, um, in the being of Lorraine Hansberry, is another kind of question as what is and who is in the archive. And finally, um, another question here about what is in the archive has to do with language and identity. And so um, the archive also must grapple with um, intersectionality and complex identities. So do we place um, Rustin and Hansberry in the LGBTQ archive or are they in the black activist um, and author archive? Or do we somehow complicate their identities and allow them to live fully in both? Also the development of new terms. So here um, the presentation began with a picture of Marsha P. Johnson. And here, um, this is also from the New York Public Library's um, collection. And we see her with the power to the people sign. And on the back of this um, photo in the archive, we have handwritten um, the photo credit and or the sticker of the photo credit. And then we have um, Marsha, Marsha P. Johnson Pickett's Bellevue Hospital to protest treatment of street people and gays. And so we also have to think about terms that are less often used or that have become offensive. Um, what are the search terms? Um, if we're thinking about queer histories, um, the Library of Congress does not use queer uh, in terms of um, the way materials are cataloged and described. So what other terms might we have to use uh, in the historical record in order to access the materials that we're trying to um, get a hold of? So these are some of the questions about what is in the archive, who is in the archive, and how do we use the archive? And I look forward to our conversation uh, and any questions. And here's my um, information and I'll stop sharing. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Mel, that was wonderful. Um, these have all been so thought provoking. I'm really excited to kind of uh, 
hear from everyone once we can actually engage in some conversation. So I'm gonna keep on rolling, but again, I see lots of hand claps um, and yeah, and snaps. <laughs> um, so I'm going to share my screen and move along to our final speaker um, before we start a open conversation. So our final speaker is Dion Moses, who is an artist, activist, and curator. In 2019, she graduated from MICA with a BFA in photography. During her senior year, she received international recognition for her project, the Maryland Institute Black Archives, MIBA, which uncovered MICA's Black history from the 1800s to present. MIBA and its accompanying programs, the exhibition Black Ives and the Remembrance Demonstration Take Back the Steps, prompted MICA's president to issue a public statement apologizing for the college's racist past. MIBA is the premier resource for information related to Black history at MICA today. The collection consists of more than a thousand primary and secondary artifacts, including photographs, rare books, art documents, newspaper clippings, and oral histories. Dion is currently enrolled in MICA's MFA curatorial practice program and preparing to relaunch MIBA's digital, digital platform in, 2020, in spring 2021. So um, with that, I'm going to stop sharing and pass it over to Dion. Thank you, Sean. Can you, everybody see this? Right? Okay, cool. Um, yes, thank you, Sean, for the great introduction. Um, however, today I'm not going to be um, talking about Micah's Black history, but uh, more about the archives and what it means to me, my practice, and how I got here. Um, uh, just a short description um, Black Ives uh, is a company that I started uh, in 2020 this year. I was a startup company thanks to Upstart's guidance. Uh, that's a MICA competition um, and the seed money, which I won for a People's Choice Award. Um, the title is an homage to my um, first exhibition. Um, this is a background, virtual background of it behind me. Um, and it's a play on um, Black life as well as archives. And the vision of Black Ives is to end the erasure of Black history and culture in the archives. And the way that I intend on doing this is by finding and assisting, um, finding these historical gaps in Black communities and assisting with the research as well as creating a sustainable archive. And that's the goal of the business. Um, and that's like where I'm going. And um, this question of what is the archive and like what it means to me um, brought me back to a place that's very personal. Um, and so when I talk about the archive, I can't go any further without thinking about my first encounter, which is with family albums and like family reunions. Um, I am African-American and West Indian. My mom's from Dominica and my father's from um, Gary, Indiana. This is a picture of my father's childhood home and I'm Gary and a picture of my family from our last year reunion. And that was in 2016, which I orchestrated. Um, and my aunt, she lives here currently. Um, but she is a family historian and she, you know, kind of wields that power. And I've noticed over the years how important the archives were and how important collecting is, especially in, in a black family. And um, everyone comes to your house. Um, you influence the family. Um, you keep those stories going. You talk, you instill the pride there. Um, we talked a lot about the great migration. We explained family traditions, uh, reunion stories, everything. It was just like a great experience um, growing up and seeing those pictures. However, I also noticed that people not only trusted her with caring for those stories and those objects, but also, you know, she cared for secrets and she actually cared for their physical bodies. So when I think about this house, I'm sorry I don't have as many pictures as Ashley to share, um, you know, due to like, you know, COVID and technology and things like that. But this house is literally like a museum. Um, there are things like all on the walls, kind of like, and pictures of family members all on the walls, kind of like how um, MIBA uh, exhibit is behind me. Um, and the rooms are almost like shrines because people have actually passed here. However, when I think about my mom's, um, history and her um, and my lineage there, um, she's from Dominica, not to be confused with uh, the Dominican Republic. It's a small island in the British uh, Virgin Islands. And she grew up in the countryside. And over the years, I've seen very few um, childhood pictures of her. Um, she said she was very poor. They didn't have uh, money to take pictures. Um, a lot of things um, were destroyed or maybe not cared for um, in the best ways possible um, because of just living conditions. Um, and in 2018, I visited um, the West Indies. Um, once um, I started, you know, at Mike and started getting into the archives, hoping that I would see some information, um, get, gather some things and learn more about my mom, my culture. But however, all those things are gone. Um, and that was, like I said, from those various reasons, but also because of natural disasters. Um, Hurricane Maria had came through not too long ago and destroyed everything. 
um, a sugar plantation. I went there to visit um, and to, to learn some more about the archives and things were just completely destroyed. They were throwing things out. So it's been a struggle over the years trying to find about my black history, um, about my family's history, and it's been turning up nothing in the archives, which is a huge problem. And just like uh, Dr. Mel said, um, you know, anti-blackness is everywhere. And over the years, the systematic oppression and people being taught that black people are inferior, it's led to, you know, the historic erasure of black people and institutional racism and this impression in determining where black people live and where they work. So our records, it's hard for me to find anything on my family, but it's evident that I can find people if I look through white people. So I have to look for a white person <laughs> to find a black person. Um, and uh, this is just an example. Um, these are indentured servants with John H. B. Latrobe, who's uh, Micah's founder. And so I think about um, these people and I and these enslaved people, and I go back and I try to look for information on them. However, I can find nothing, and it makes me wonder: like, are they my ancestors? Ancestors? Could they be yours? Could they be a student who, who's here now? So struggling to find that information um, and thinking about this presentation today, um, I realize how incomplete I've, I've been and how I've been feeling, and um, that I've. I've on and off, you know, throughout the years and, and working on this project and trying to find my own um, my own history. I'm so thankful for the Afro and hearing Ashley and other um, and Mel talk about how they've gotten information from the Afro. And I see Savannah, I know Savannah's in here, so shout out to Savannah um, with the Afro on how they've um, how they are able, how we're able to find black stories in these black narratives. Because traditionally we're gonna have to get we would get them from these white lenses like newspaper, like Baltimore Sun and things like that. So I'm so thankful um, for these for these archives and allowing me to um, fill these historical gaps. And so that's kind of like how MIBA started, was a way for me to orient myself at MICA and figure out like where, what was going on here, where I was at. And also as a way to, you know, think about other students because we did not know um, MICA's uh, black history. Um, and it's also very personal to me because like I said, I found connections through other students like Leanne A. Norris, he's a veteran. I'm also a veteran. I served for seven years in the army before I came to MICA. So when I see connections there, it makes me think of my Micah family, um, my Micah Black family that I have here. And Tamara Dobson, she was Cleopatra Jones. She graduated Micah in the 17th and she has multiple sclerosis, which is, I, I have multiple sclerosis. So I find the commonalities in those. And it's very personal as uh, Dr. Mel said, it's, it's funny how all of our presentations are somewhat combining and making me think about my own um, and how it's all like cyclical that's coming back. So was, I was getting chills listening to all these presentations and thinking at first that my wouldn't be um, aligned, but it is very much so aligned. And I'm like a product of all these different um, culmination things. And I'm a result of not being able to see and find your black history, but wanting that autonomy and, and doing it yourself. So in summary, when I think about the archive and what it means to me at this moment, um, I have to use, and I'm thinking about it of a, as, a, as a family album and I'm using MIB as an analogy. And for me, it's very powerful because I'm assigning um, voice and value. Um, but it's also for me, like it's a living, uh, it's a living archive and it's a reflection of me. And um, it's a reflection of what I'm seeing and an intuitive response to like the research that I'm doing. And it makes me think about my aunt and about um, the elders who, who are collecting now and um, those other archives um, that have been popping up online, like the ones Jenny has mentioned. Here's the list of a few that I've been following on Instagram um, and how that work needs to be preserved and valued and highlighted and supported and uplifted. And, ar and archivists of color um, do exist and may they, they may have not have went these traditional route, routes, but um, the knowledge that we are collecting and um, creating for our communities is very, very important. And so um, I'll drop a link in the chat of some of these names um, but I'm gonna stop right there. Oh, shameless plug, please follow me on Instagram. Um, I'm a little quiet right now on Instagram, but I am, I've been in the archives studying and researching um, the black history. Um, and so I'm working on that. So please follow us on Instagram and also keep a lookout for the website. Um, like Sean said, I am revamping that um, in 2021. I'm thinking about ways to reimagine the archive and display information for our community um, as well as providing like research. So thank you so much, Sean, back to you. Awesome, thank you so much. Um, I am just so pleased uh, that each of these amazing um, researchers, artists, thinkers um, were willing to come make a sort of dream of mine come to life, which is having this kind of expansive conversation um, around the archive that necessarily involves people who work in archives, people who use archives, and I actually, didn't totally expect, but was thrilled by the sort of deep emotional connection um, between like personal identity and archives that was, uh, you know, running through this talk. Um, so 
what we'll do now is maybe I'll get st uh, started off with a question, um, but then folks can also feel free to write into the chat if you have questions for any of our speakers. Um, and as well, speakers, I encourage you to, you know, I know that each of you had a lot of reactions and thoughts to each other's presentations, so I, I encourage you to kind of um, jump in with that. But I'm going to start with a question that I've been thinking about for kind of a long time. Um, and uh, it's sort of a long one, so I apologize <laughs> in advance. And a lot of you kind of touched on this, but um, in your presentations, but you know, the history of archives is one that is found, founded on the kind of preservation of official histories of countries and institutions um, and so on. And so they are kind of historically steeped in colonial patriarchal um, white supremacist narratives, right? And so I'm curious about um, ways to navigate this history and also uplift the voices that are often most marginalized. And so for me, one of the questions I think about a lot is the um, sort of Audre Lorde's warning, right? That the master's tools will never dismantle the master's house. Um, and I'm wondering how we can potentially use, and I think some of you are doing this in your work, but how we can use archival technologies to challenge sort of hegemony and, and these like grand structural narratives. And that's for anyone to jump in on. <laughs> okay. Um, so um, when I thought about when you sent me this question, uh, Sean, I did, uh, I thought about that. And that's kind of like my last point that I, I that I said. And I thought about that, um, that, you know, other cultures have been preserving um, and archiving long before, you know, colonization started. So archivists of color are everywhere like my aunt, my neighbors and our parents. And like I said, I think like those, these IG sites and these artists and these archivists are working and like using the term archivist, um, it's, I've been struggling a lot with that word. And even though I'm not like a, a tra classically trained archivist, I need to own the fact that I am archiving and that I am an archivist in those, in that sense. And um, I don't think that you have to be, um, and also I see that there are, you know, sometimes when I was thinking about this, I'm sorry, I lost my place when I, I answered this question for you, I'm sorry. Um, that the work that they're doing needs to be recognized and preserved. And it's been a lot, it's been very difficult, um, especially for me. Um, I'm not, I'm just an individual and I am aligned with the school. Um, but when I think about getting that support and um, trying to preserve and keep this work going, it's been very difficult um, if you're not aligned or when you're trying to apply for grants and things like that. So I think that that's one way that we can um, uplift these voices by uplifting the people who are doing this work right now. Awesome, thank you. I'm actually gonna stop sharing because I think it's not picking up uh, anybody else's audio. Um, so yeah, does anyone else have, have thoughts on that or anything else you wanna jump in with um, in terms of like this question of like the master's tools and archival technologies? Uh, I can. So the dominant culture, the hegemony in the settler state of this nation, the United States of America, um, indigenous people are supposed to either die off or just disappear or be relegated to the past. And by engaging with our documentation and archives, like us living indigenous people going in and engaging, like we remind everybody that we're still here. Um, and then when we return, when we repatriate these materials back to our communities, they become reactivated. Like there's a really great uh, piece that the Library of Congress published recently about their efforts to repatriate Passamaquoddy language. Um, the earliest recordings we have in this country of, of language is indigenous from indigenous nations. So the Passamaquoddy got their recordings back and now they're like recognizing their songs, their ancestors, and you know, these things just come to life again when they're returned to their community of origin. And it's not so different from what's happening when I take pictures with my phone and, and put them all over social media for my community to enjoy despite what Hearst or whoever has to say about copyright because they, they don't even know they're in there, you know? like. I'm returning people's grandparents, I'm returning their preachers, their teachers, their brothers and sisters, like that's that's what we're doing. 
I'll jump in. So I think about this question a lot in terms of the work that I do with We Here, which Sean mentioned from my bio is a community and a business for uh, people who identify as Black, Indigenous, and people of color who work in libraries and archives um, because, you know, I think about it in the sense uh, that we are autonomous and, you know, when we do have power, which we do now within this group, um, will we just do the same things and kind of perpetuate those same systems of oppression um, and structural inequities? Um, but I think that one thing I've been thinking about a lot in terms of how we navigate the history and uplift the voice of the most marginalized is to, to think about this very genuinely and not just do something because it's on trend or for clout online. Um, I think about that a lot in terms of archives, archives and libraries, sort of presenting as, you know, these very, I don't know, these institutions that have always had these collections um, or always cared about them. Um, so I would love to see people doing things uh, around Black history, not in Black, just Black History Month, for example. Um, so. Yeah, I think that that's um, that that's that's a good one, and I think one of the this is actually a question that was brought up kind of in your presentation, Jenny, too. Um, but I'm curious to hear from other folks as well um, a little bit on you know like talking about the archive, and Jenny mentioned the sort of erasure of the archivist um, as a uh, as a as a actual human doing this work, right? Um, and and so I'm curious. Uh, to you all what the term archivist kind of means to you um, and how it plays out in, in your practice. Like, do you think of yourself as an archivist? Do you not think of yourself as an archivist? Um, and yeah, to Jenny's question, like who is, who is the archivist is kind of the um, question I'm getting at. And Jenny, I know you have a lot of thoughts on this, so feel free to jump in with more if you want. I mean, I think because, uh, so I talked about like erasure on both sides, right? And I think that for so long, these institutions didn't care about by POC, black, indigenous and people of color identities. Um, you know, I can't, I don't wanna, well, whatever, I won't, I won't approach that topic of MCHC, but, um, you know, so I think it's hard to, I, I really, I feel more open about the word. Um, obviously I'm coming from an information studies background. So I, you know, think very much in that sort of way that an archivist is a person who has a job as an archivist and does this work. But like Dion said, you know, there are these, uh, our family members, you know, when Dion was talking about her aunt, that's like, that sounds like my aunt, you know, she's the one that holds every, she calls everybody, She's like, oh, I got to show you these pictures. You know what I mean? So I just feel like um, for so long, marginalized communities were left out of the discussion that um, doing the work that Dion is doing or that Ashley's doing or Dr. Lewis is doing, uh, in addition to the people that I showed, it's almost like they're doing more for the profession than the profession's doing for the profession, if that makes sense. It also makes me think about how amazing the archives could be or how they could be transformed and changed um, with the input from these other communities and our um, our ancestors and like my aunt. Because when I try to tell and speak to my family about the archive, um, sometimes they don't care. I have to, they have to tell me the ways in which they need to enter it. Um, so that's why I say the archive is so important to me in my BA and how I want to think about redesigning this website because I don't think it's very accessible to my community and they're not being, it's not being received well from them. So that's like my first step is to make the information digestible and, and able for them to be, for them to access it. Yeah, I think that those are really beautiful ways of describing it. Yeah, go ahead, Ashley. Sorry, I was gonna say the, the term doesn't really mean a whole lot to me, like, um, I guess what what helps me is my background as an artist. I just kind of stumbled into archival work. 
um, with under that name, you know, like when I when I learned about archival research in my um, PhD program in American studies, I was like, oh yeah, I live in one. Like I live in my grandparents' house with all their stuff. Like it, and um, that's when I first started to think about how material culture, that's another fancy word, doesn't really mean, it's just stuff. Um, like it was my grandfather's gardening hat hanging on the wall. It, it performs a higher function now, right? Like it's part of my archive of their stuff because it's just there for its historical value. I don't wear it to go out and garden. So like, I feel like you just um, explained to people that maybe we're all archivists, like, you know, a, a lot of Lumbee people are archivists and they would say they just have junk laying around, but um, their junk has really great institutional memory for our community. Like my aunt calls me up and says, I have some old papers, maybe you're interested in them. And then I go look and they're like the complete history of our church outlined what people, what my uncle was doing in the meetings, like on what day. So I, the, the titles don't always do us favors. And I think we put too much stock into them. Yes, as someone who doesn't necessarily identify as an archivist, my wife is an archivist. Shout out to DCPL, uh, the People's Archive, woohoo! Carrie Cotton Williams, historian, archivist. Um, but I also hope that my classroom is full of archivists and that when folks are learning history, and it seems like history, it's a history that's not theirs and they can't touch. And that when folks think about the archive, it's something locked away, you know, in a movie with lots of columns and things that are like burning and exploding. So there are these ways in which people don't think that their, their own um, um, collection or their family's collection or even public collections that are and or should be accessible to them, um, people don't think of them as theirs. And so I'm hoping that um, by really working with archival materials in the classroom, um, that folks will become curious and in, in assigning projects that encourage folks to use um, uh, archival materials and explore, um, I'm, I'm hoping that that is, um, you know, inspirational and that folks understand that that, um, that kind of Western, um, you know, interpretation of the barrier between the public and the archive protecting um, the materials from the public, that we kind of reverse that and say the archive is the public and the archive is for the public and the archive is with the public. Yeah, I, I love that. Um, I am gonna jump to the chat because there's a couple of good questions. Um, first from, from Nina, um, when thinking of grounding, how do you, the speakers personally find solitude in recharging such powerful higher purposes through, your, through this work? Self-care is extremely important, yet a challenge at times when the work is never ending. Um, hi, Nina. I, I would say um, for your question, um, there are some times when, um, when I was talking about like voice and um, like assigning value, like there, is time, there are times I find myself in the archive um, trying to find records of enslaved people or um, looking at really um, difficult material. And so sometimes when it just gets too much and it just like kind of bogs me down, honestly, I go and I turn to the black students and the black people that I found the archive and I put my um, energy into um, uncovering what they've done. And, and honestly, like Harry T. Pratt, he's the first black graduate at Mike. I go to him a lot. Um, there's a lot more research I need to do on him, but he did a lot for um, Baltimore um, education. And um, every time I look up and look for information under him and the work that he's done, it, it lifts me up. And it makes me and it, give, and it re energizes me to keep going and doing this work. Um, so even though I should probably be resting, um, I continue to do the work, but um, I try to um, watch the content and, and my energy and make sure I'm, I'm trying to sometimes move it towards a more positive, um, positive field. And also I wanna keep the archive um, positive as well. I don't wanna continue to, to make trauma porn or um, things like that for the black community. I want, I want 
um, the things that I'm doing and the stories that I'm telling to be positive um, and contradict that um, typical narrative of African-Americans um, struggling. At the end just reminded me the, the best part of all of this for me is bringing what I found back to the elders so they can see it and then they get excited and then I'm just like over the moon because they're my favorite people and I, I never get tired of spending time with them ever. They're the funniest, wisest, like best. Also, I take a walk every single morning and I try really hard to get enough sleep. Like I monitor my sleep because and I drink a lot of water. Not saying I have this down, but those are my strategies. Hi, Nina. Um, for me, I like to, um, when I'm discovering people or places or um, histories, I actually like to have ceremony. And so this is a part of my practice, uh, my ancestral, ancestral practice um, to, um, do something, do a kind of honoring in order to, um, you know, kind of ask permission and um, um, be able to um, illustrate and celebrate the way in which that history will be honored. Um, and so that's, that's another way um, when there's, you know, heavy material or um, something that is in bits and pieces and it feels really uh, uncomfortable and disorienting because um, an, an individual or a story or a history um, has been um, separated from itself um, to do some of that um, spiritual work with the material or the history or the, um, the story in order to um, um, kind of bring it into it, its own um, uh, living version of itself. Great question, Nina. Um, I, I have to have pretty strict boundaries because I'm the type of person that will not stop working. Um, so I need to turn off my computers and just, just stop. Um, or else I'll just get wrapped up in whatever various projects I'm doing. But, you know, most of my work is focused on critiquing my profession. So it can get sad because I'm just constantly presenting on uh, just how rough things are for by POC um, in the profession. So I look to we here um, for a lot of that. Like I have people, other admins, it's an admin team of five and you know I look to them I look to friends that are in it and just that community to keep keep it going thanks everyone um there's another question in the chat um from Mariella that is um would you all um comment on archon and or archivist um I'm not sure, I might need more context for that, but I'm not sure if anyone else has a better understanding. So uh, Mariella, if you're there, maybe you could um, just expand a little bit on what you mean by Archon and versus Archivist. Ah. Got it. So I think, yeah, Archon is actually like the Greek word is actually ruler. Um, this was my what my Googling told me as well. Um, and so Marielle said, I meant Archon as the ruler or keeper of the archive versus our agency as citizens to the archive. Which I think is kind of getting at some of the tension that's been coming up between um, preservation and access as well. Uh, I'll just say that, um... You know, I was really trained on how to process archives in the traditional sense at New York Public Library. I did an internship um, there when I was in grad school and they, it was refreshing because the way that they taught us 
to process collections was, you know, this isn't yours. Like this, you don't have an emotional, this is not like something that you're gonna, you know, keep and do a lot of research on because that's the researcher's job to sort of like add things to the way that we've described it. Cause we can't possibly process everything that we have and then, you know, do research on top of that. That's sort of why we try to get it out to researchers um, quickly. So that was refreshing to, to be in that situation, having come from predominantly white institutions that um, were kind of doing things in ways that weren't set uh, in stone or like the how, how they went about it um, was not so laid out in, in terms of like, you know, this is how we process things. Um, but, you know, that sort of, I don't know if the other panelists have ever experienced this, but people who just have a really strong emotional attachment to two things and they're almost like, this is mine and you don't know enough about it to access it. Um, I think that that's kind of, uh, when I think about that, I think of kind of the, this generation that's probably um, phasing out. And I don't mean that in an age uh, specific category. I just mean like the way that you maybe were taught how to process collections. Um, kind of, uh, I kind of am looking at the question that Mari Mariella said as a ruler or keeper of the archive versus our agency as citizens of the archive. And I feel like that's kind of like where I'm kind of transitioning right now. Um, like Black Eyes is the um, umbrella and then MIBA is like underneath the Maryland Two Black Archives. So right now I've been the person mostly tending to it and, and, and caring for it. But my goal is, and right now I have built a team of researchers to help and start continuing on that work. So moving past it, just being mine, I am emotionally attached to it, Jenny. I am emotionally attached. Like I said, I'm these, the people, the students and people that I found, like, they're my family um, and I, I'm always gonna be here and I'm always gonna um, be there. But um, I think that's the part that I'm moving towards and through with, with, the, with the company and, um, and thesis is, is starting up and training up a staff and a team and hopefully one day trying to find a way to see how this will live at MICA. Maybe it, it can have a space with the Harry T. Pratt Society, space for creative black imagination. Uh, there's like a lot of possibilities like maybe that could happen with it. But I am, I think when I'm looking at Marielle's question and, and thinking about what I'm doing, I am trying to move out of um, being so much the person who's contributing to the archive and asking the community to contribute to the archive, not only with their images, but also, you know, through the, um, the website. And I'm hoping one of those ways is like metadata. And um, I could put that information in, but there's also people in the community who might see those images. And like I posted things on Instagram and people have hit me up and sent me other articles that they have about people. So other people using the, that metadata and ways of um, describing the articles um, that will move us outside of just like one um, specific narrative or one person, myself or others included. In my experience thus far, um, the rulers, I guess, would be the, the gatekeepers, like the librarians and the archivists. And I've been fortunate. They're like the real MVPs. I get into it. You know, you're supposed to be quiet in the library. I get in there and I find something and I, I, I yell, I holler. And I get excited and then they get excited. And almost everybody I've worked with at every archive, they're like, yeah, let's do this, have at it. Like, how can I help? How can we get this to your community? How can we get it out in the world? And they will remind me of copyright restrictions and advise me. Um, and then I take that information and, and do what I will. But um, shout out to all the librarians and archivists who have helped me and who, who really just wanna help everybody on their journey of research. Thank you, Ashley. I just gotta, yes, I gotta piggyback on that. I do have to say, yes, that, that made me think of Kathy, Jenny, everybody, Decker Library, Heather, um, who have helped me, Sean as well, people who've helped with this archive. So um, yes, that, that collaboration is necessary. And like Jenny said, I think it is also being phased out. Yeah, and I just wanna say real quick that like, it's it totally makes sense, Dion, why you have a personal attachment because you're doing this work and you're doing, it, it's, it's just, it's sort of, to me, I see it as like your work, but it becomes an issue when then you determine who has access to that, right? So it's like, that is the real issue. So you having a personal connection makes complete sense. Just as I'm sure the people that I showed in my presentation have a personal, you know, they really have a personal connection. And that I think also in that way uh, is not something that, uh, 
you know, professionals are traditionally allowed to. So it's like this idea of like wanting to care for a collection and having a personal connection is different from sort of that gatekeeping of like, well, you're not qualified enough to access this or whatever. That's something I've personally seen, um, unfortunately, early in my career. Sorry. Yeah, I wanted to, to jump in too, because I this is actually one of the things that I wanted to, to talk about in this discussion, um, both on a sort of ethical and also a practical level. Um, so like, I'm not an archivist, but my introduction to archives was working with the Occupy Wall Street Archives Working Group, which was working to archive and preserve um, everything that happened in um, Liberty Plaza in New York and, and during the Occupy um, moment, right? So it was like a physical and a digital archive. And what ended up happening is it got donated to the Tamament Library, which used to be a um, independent labor archive that is now housed at NYU. And this became actually a real struggle within the group to decide, does this belong at an institution that is not a public institution? The Tamament is public, but you have to have a government ID. And if any of you know, Occupy activists, you know, that having a government ID is maybe not the thing they want to do um, in order to access the archive. And so that question of like, how do we, without any funds, how do we keep this collection? How do we support it? How do we make it available? But also, how do we make it accessible to the people who created it for who it's for? Um, and so I think that maybe that's the sort of add on to that question that I would pose to everyone. And then Vicky, I see that you have your hand raised. So we'll um, I'll get to you in, in just just a moment because I think yeah that's I'm just excited to hear what everyone has to say about that. And also I encourage if there are any archivists in the to feel free to post in the chat as well because I think this is kind of one of the questions of like money preservation and access. I would love to hear from from archivists, but you know the the question of money is you know the labor behind all of this work. So you kind of brought that up, Sean. This you know public versus private. Like I've had experience in private institutions um, more so than public, but but yeah, just the the people behind uh, these institutions. And I guess we're adding more more complexity to the question rather than <laughs> responding to it. But um, also thinking about um, when folks are um, donating um, their collections or um, so the acquisition type of process, like who can pay for things and who, what institutions can't pay for it. And often the institutions that can pay for um, acquiring something are not, don't make it as accessible as the institutions who can't pay for something. Um, and so when we're thinking about the valuation of something, um, how do we grapple with, you know, what it's worth, quote unquote, and, you know, being compensated, um, whether it's an estate or an individual or whatever, or community. Um, and also that the idea that if you do offer it to a public institution and that institution is not able to compensate um, or does not invite <laughs> that, um, you know, what is the trade-off there um, and, and how do collections then go to different places for those reasons as well? Sorry, I was muted. I'm gonna go ahead and unmute um, Vicky Pass now, um, who also has a question. Thank you all so much for these presentations. Um, I'm a total like archive nerd. So Dr. Miner, you're talking about like the moment where you like can't not be loud in the archive because you found something exciting. Like I really resonate with that. Um, and it's, it's really interesting for me to see the work that you all are doing in the archive because to me like all of all of the archives that you all are creating because I'm a my work is in fashion history I'm seeing as fashion archives and all of the ways that you know those those archives can be read as revealing like different people's everyday forms of dress and how that might relate to their everyday lives or protest or their identities all all these different questions um and the ways in which one thing that that your presentations brought up for me which I wanted 
to ask y'all to talk a little bit about is the ways that there are these like intersections of archives. And I think um, Dr. Lewis really highlighted that, that like you have these, um, these folks who could turn up um, in uh, an African-American history archive, a queer history archive, and maybe even somewhere else. And, you know, what are the ways that, you know, we can kind of build out these intersections between these archives. Um, and maybe that, like, maybe that's the job of the researcher, you know, maybe that's sort of where that activity happens. But I think that's, that's such an interesting question and challenge, especially like from, you know, a researcher's perspective, um, the issue of access that y'all are bringing up is such a crucial one, because there's often archives that as a researcher you don't have access to either because you don't have the money to get there or they won't let you in. I often run into stuff I'm not allowed to publish because either I can't afford to publish it or I'm not allowed to publish it for, you know, licensing reasons. So um, I guess, yeah, I think I'm bumbling around asking a question about kind of how y'all are thinking about how, um, how to kind of um, illuminate these ways in which different archives intersect with one another. Um, hi, Vicki. So um, I am trying to do that, or I think that I am doing that in the ways in which I'm working in, um, especially some things that I have planned for the future. And so like um, one, one example I'm trying, I can give is like Mabel Brooks. Um, Mabel Brooks tried to come to Micah in the 1920s, but was denied because of the color of her skin. But then she went on to study at like the Pennsylvania Academy of Fine Art and then also um, at Yale. And she was the first black person to graduate with a degree in painting from Yale after she described it as years of hell. Um, and so when I go and I try to research her um, and I'll research Yale's black history, she is nowhere to be mentioned or nowhere to be found. However, in her art in, in Yale's archives, um, they do have a copy of her thesis. Um, and I can't, can't see it right now because of COVID, but I'm trying to get to that. And also going and looking at her, looking at census reports and things of where she went. I have connections to her in Georgia, um, college on there as well as like Tallahassee State. So like I'm thinking of like the ways in which yes those um, those archives intersect and my goal is to um, and I'm planning on it reaching out to these archives let them know this information and that she does exist but then um, in the work through which I'll be contextualizing it and putting it online um, using that metadata and trying to like link those um, those uh, that information and one of the things that Salvador had wrote in the um, chat about like open access software um, I have been looking into open access software and um, in, in ways of which to use that. Um, but there are like certain parameters and things that I found like where it doesn't um, allow like some of those met that metadata and start come up or and pop up on like Google searches um, and like the SEO terminology. And so um, that's why I've, like my website right now is in a blog format, which is really great because it hits those sites and things like that and opens it up to my community where we wouldn't have had, we, were, where we can't find those. You have to get an account and things like that, even for some of those open source um, archives that are free. Um, so there is still, again, another barrier. So I think that that's one way, Victoria, that I'm trying um, to combat that and try to like combine and bring together those archives and also, of course, publishing um, things in the future. But one of the goals that I hope that knowing this information at Yale and then going and talking to them about this, maybe inspiring some of those other Black students, we can start to go on and therefore um, discover their Black history. Um, and so that's, what you, of course, one of the goals of Black Eyes is to um, end that erasure. So using that information, um, connecting Micah, Yale, Georgia, Tallahassee, um, that's the goal to do all of that. So yeah, hopefully um, get working on that as soon as I can graduate. <laughs> I'm making a whole new archive in collaboration with the folks in special collections at UMBC. I, I think I said this, but like um, I found things everywhere and it is extremely unlikely that my community would go to all these places and have the wherewithal to navigate the bureaucracy and do all the things to see what I'm seeing. So like it's super important to get it all in one place or at least two places. So the idea is the physical materials will live at UMBC because it's publicly accessible and climate controlled and people will take care of the, the artifacts, right? But then on the back end, it's available online and through the Baltimore American Indian Center, which is somewhere where we know our people will go and do go. So, and, and like all the materials are copyrighted and they belong to other collections, right? Well, the archivists at UMBC are like, we'll think of ways 
around that because it's just that important to get everything together. Great. Hi, Vicki. Um, I, I think also teaching people how to um, explore and put those puzzle pieces together is really important and to think about their own um, histories and archival research um, in ways that are different from how people have, have been taught to kind of sit with one collection and mine it and really just be there. Um, but to think about how, what are the other connect connections and what are the other collections um, to encourage folks to think intersectionally, think interdisciplinarily um, and build that skill set um, in, in, into the learning process, um, even at the undergraduate level, so that folks who want or need to um, put those different collections together um, and then write or produce something that is more widely available than the actual collections themselves, they'll be able to um, navigate um, both the navigate the ways in which the collections can be connected and then produce something that brings them together that more people have access to uh, whether that's a, a book a presentation a community you know panel whatever that might be but in order to um, have folks um, have those important connections made they're going to have to um, you know learn and have facility with that as a skill set so saying that not as an archivist, but um, as, a, as a teacher. Yeah, I was thinking about this question a lot because um, I think time and labor is, again, a major part of this. And I think it depends on what kind of institution you're at. Um, as I said, I was at New York Public Library and they have just a huge amount of collections to process. So that's why they take the approach to like, you know, just get it out. But when I was working with the Henderson collection, you know, I was only processing a couple collections at the time. So I had time to develop an exhibition and a public program. Um, but also I had to think about, you know, very logistically, like how the people that were in Henderson's photographs could still be alive. And that information that they have about Henderson's photographs was something that I wanted to capture. It might be a generation that would really just prefer not to look at stuff online. So I just really had to think about, you know, how do I get this in front of people? So I made reference images of all 7,000 photographs, um, negatives, because they're in negative form too. And, you know, how are you gonna identify somebody who's in negative form? So I had to really think through this to get the people that I wanted to see this collection in front of this collection to help us identify. Um, so we had events around um, identification, but also just a way to kind of celebrate this time period with people that might remember it or just would want to see it. Um, so I think, you know, not every archivist can do that. As I mentioned in my presentation, it's, you know, some people are like, that's not really what I'm here for. I'm here to just sort of get you access to it. Um, but it, you know, it just depends on what type of institution you're working at or what kind of archive you're, you're looking at. I want to highlight as well um, that um, Dr. Sherry Parks put a useful and uh, helpful link to uh, Mellon funding um, for specifically researchers of African American archives. Um, so if anyone's interested in that, make sure that you um, take a look at that. And then there's also a question in the chat from, um, apologies if I um, butcher your name, but Jasmine Benton. Um, which is, uh, do any of you have any thoughts on esoteric knowledge in archives and avoiding voyeurism in archival engagement? Mm, I think that's a really important question. Um, and sometimes, um, again, from a, a teaching perspective in the classroom, um, kind of un before really deeply engaging the material, 
there is a process of um, exploring how it was, how and why it was collected um, and the language that's used. And so in many cases, um, there particularly archives uh, of folks of color, there is, um, there was a particular kind of project that was really about dehumanization, colonization, um, enslavement. Um, and, and so there is a, a process for introducing folks to the how and why, why are the descriptors, the descriptors, why are, is the framing maybe voyeuristic as you said, um, or it, you know, exoticizing the community. Um, what were the, um, what was the purpose of documenting um, this group of people or this scenario or this situation, um, you know, around race, it might be um, voyeuristic and or um, exoticizing in one particular way. And around sexuality, it might be voyeuristic or exoticizing in another way. Um, and so uh, often the, the, the collections themselves contain um, or, and, or, and or are coming from that point of view and really unpacking that and um, having a, a critical approach um, is one of the first steps I'd say. Um, and we can't really undo the past and how this collection came to be and the terms that were used in the framing. Um, but uh, what we can do is, you know, kind of reframe and re um, uh, add different language in our own terminology of this moment, um, add reverence um, and do something different with it. So that would be one of one of the ways in which I would approach that that challenge. I, I wonder, Jasmine, if you might say more about what you mean by esoteric knowledge. Yes, hi. Um, I meant like we have this drive that it's important to build our own community archives. Um, but some things may not belong in, like outside of our communities, like they may not belong in a place that's separated from us, from where they originated. And that's uh, something that I feel a lot of tension about. And I'm not sure if other people are feeling that tension or what they're thinking about. Gotcha. Um, I think folks are talking about Mukur Mukurtu in the chat a little bit. Uh, would you call, is it a content management system as someone? Okay. So this is a system that indigenous people came up with to label certain materials um, according to who should be able to access them and when. So that's, that's really cool. Um, I don't know how widely it's used. I learned about it from colleagues at the Library of Congress, American Folklife Center. Um, and I, I agree with you that not everything's for everybody and that it ends up separated from its community of origin and um, it's accessible in a way that's completely inappropriate. So, you know, that's why we have to collectively work on repatriation, but Maybe somebody could say something more about Mukurtu than I can. I just put a link into the chat to, um, in terms of like the uh, question of like being forgotten and like who gets to. Um, who gets to tell these histories? Um, and just to, to sort of like talk about a, an archivist, um, Bern Harris, who has written a fair amount about like the right to be forgotten and the right to forgetting, um, because I think we often think of like the right to remember, um, but it's important to, to acknowledge that sometimes people don't want to be remembered, right? Or they don't want their stories to be made public.
I love that we're having that the, in the chat. There's this parallel discussion happening about the open source archival software. This is really uh, wonderful, <laughs> and I super appreciate it. Um, uh, are there any other questions that any of the panelists have um, for each other? I'm curious, kind of, what came up for you in listening to each other talk about your own personal experiences. I love this idea of the archive of emotions or the archive of feeling. Um, and I'm curious if other folks wanna kind of comment on that idea that um, Dr. Mel um, brought up in their presentation. I mean, I kind of talked about it, uh, about, about that archival feeling um, in, in that, how do I put this? Um, the, like the archive of feeling and like, I, it's just, I get so many emotions when I run through the archive. Um, it's up, it's down. Um, it's also, you don't know what you're, what you can come up with or what's going to happen that day. Um, weirdly, sometimes I think of it as, um, it's, it's really fun to me um, in, in terms of that. And sometimes I even think of it as like, I know it's a cheesy thing, but like Catfish the TV show um, in terms of like knowing that I'm going into an area that is like going to mostly, most of the time come from a white lens. So I have to remember and tell myself that, that this might not all be true. And um, that I'm gonna have to look deeper into um, into what um, information is being provided to me there. So like I, I I sometimes take pleasure and joy into like going and looking and 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 um, looking at the stories and watching them run parallel to Micah or running parallel to Baltimore's history and seeing and making sure and checking and double checking these facts. So um, the art it is an archive of feeling and emotion and um, I, I get excited when I when I make these new connections and, and then I get attached to it and. Um, and it, it's just a, I don't know, MIBA, it, it's a, it's, it's really like a, a baby for me. And um, the archive is something that has really like changed my life. And it's something that has like, honestly grown me as a, as a better, as a better human being, as a better person um, through working in this way and, and acknowledging and knowing my community the way I do. So um, I really am thankful for the archives and archivists and this whole entire journey, honestly. That's so beautiful, Deanna. <laughs> Um, yeah, I feel the same way about Henderson. Like I definitely felt like the Henderson collection was it what it's what got me to where I am now. And um, it really did because I was literally working all day at my office, then going home and continuing that work. Um, I really felt like, you know, an attachment to this collection, but also knowing that it's gonna live beyond my time at that institution. Um, it's what made me, you know, kind of keep going because I knew no nobody else at the time at least was gonna do this work. So, you know, and similar to, to what, D I think I heard Dion say this, but, you know, the, the searching, you know, I was in the Afro-American newspaper archive, which the Enoch Pratt Free Library has access to um, all the time and finding inaccuracies in books and I felt a little bit betrayed because I was like, I thought this was supposed to be like fact checked and, you know, so that's, I've worked that into my, my instruction sessions is like, you know, history can be inaccurate. Um, and so like sort of double checking those sources is important, but, but yeah, I mean, when you, when you are putting so much work and effort into something to see it, you know, get access to or get recognition or see the value in it, um, it can be very emotional. And it's also um, emotional for the community as well. Um, I know when I had the exhibition and it traveled from the main building, from the uh, Brown, from Brown to, to Maine, um, one of the, um, I found um, a woman, her brother had passed um, and he was a student at Mike and she came and she cried um, about, you know, the information that she saw about the college and how much he loved the school. And, you know, she also contributed, you know, to the archive. And, you know, like Miss Gloria, she, um, I took her portrait for the archive and she recently retired from MICA. And, um, you know, now she's forever in the archive. So like, it really has touched the community um, at the college as well, not just myself. It doesn't just invoke feeling in me. 
and invoked an entire wave throughout the, the Black community in Micah. And some people um, are wanting it to come back. I want to see it come back and want a permanent place for it at the college. So it hasn't just like, you know, captured me. It's also captured the college and, you know, members of my community too. So oh, there's a bunch the of permanency. Sorry, I'm lobbying for the permanency. Uh, yeah, <laughs> and funding, funding permanency. <laughs> yeah. Um, it so the, Ashley posted an article. Um, yeah, and then I I want to uh, highlight something that Nina posted as well, um, which is that each of you, the panelists, deserve permanent and paid spaces of history documented in areas of choice having a trusted team of supportive people coming together and archiving, even symbolic visible monuments for the community to see themselves reflected in honorable ways, which I think is a really beautiful um, way of describing the work that I think you all um, have, have been doing. Um, and now Jenny's crying. <laughs> um, so, <laughs> so this is the sort of final call for, for questions. Um, and sort of a wrap up, um, I, I wanna say how thankful I am to have had all of these um, panelists come talk. Um, as I said, this has been kind of a dream of mine um, for a long time and I've been following each of, uh, each of you all's work um, and in different ways uh, for, for a long time. So it's exciting to have everyone in conversation together. Um, I encourage any students in the room to keep an eye out for Dr. Mel's queer memory class. It's probably the most fun I've ever had doing a library instruction session because we critiqued Library of Congress catalog set, <laughs> like subject headings. And um, it was really fun to kind of nerd out in the library way and think about the problematic ways we categorize information. Um, so definitely students do that. And also just like, keep an eye out on um, both Dion and Ashley's work as well as Jenny's work and um, follow all of them. I think, yeah, I encourage everyone to put um, contact information um, or uh, anything anything else, Instagrams, et cetera. There, um, there, those do exist on the slides, um, which I can share with everyone who registered. And like I said, I will be, um, I will be making a recording of this. Um, just keep in mind that uh, the, the process of captioning is fairly manual. <laughs> so it, it's going to take probably a little bit more than like tomorrow. But I will send this out to um, everybody who registered because I got a number of um, responses from folks who were not able to attend but really wanted to hear this conversation. Um, and I hope that you all um, also just stay in touch and, and keep an eye out on the series. Um, I'm not sure what the next iteration will be, but it will likely be next semester. Um, and I'll work with the Art History and Humanistic Studies departments to kind of um, plan. I have some ideas brewing already. Um, and uh, I want to especially thank um, Strategic Initiatives and the Space for Creative Black Imagination um, and just yeah, in support, supporting this event and the art history and humanistic study departments as well for being um, super supportive of this. Yeah, and a, a lot of things happening in the chat in terms of things uh, to discuss. And I guess we actually got a, a question. My final call for questions worked. Um, so we'll close out um, with Salvador's question. Um, in class, we're studying the idea of the body as the archive. And I wonder if you can share your thought on this topic, which is actually very great because Dr. Mel asked a question that we didn't get to um, about the embodied archive um, when we were kind of discussing in advance of this meeting. So maybe you all can, maybe Dr. Mel, you can kind of uh, start us off on this idea of the embodied archive or the body and the archive or the body as archive. Sure. Woo, my favorite. Uh, <laughs> so, um, in in kind of a queer theory and feminist theory realm, thinking about the the body as archive um, and experiential knowledges, 
um, um, felt intuitions, all of those things that manifest physically um, and the way in which they live in the body. Um, uh, so even thinking about queer memory and what I was going to title that class, it's not history, it's, it's memories that live and that live in and on the body. Um, and so I, I do think of um, both that archive of feeling that is like affect and then um, the, the body as archive um, and, and the ways in which we um, often mistake that when we're thinking only about documents or we're thinking only about um, um, materials that are not um, uh, embodied or that are not alive or that have never been alive, um, that are inanimate. Um, and so kind of um, thinking about the, the ways in which the body is the vessel for uh, experiential knowledge is kind of my approach to the archive. Um, the body as archive and experiential knowledges um, and the evidence of felt intuition. Um, and so um, that, that is something that really excites me. And it's, it's the now archive of our own corporeal presence in our reality at this moment. And it's also recognizing that the people in the archive had the same physical corporeal reality. Um, and I, I think that that's also uh, unclear and maybe misunderstood when we think about history um, and acknowledging the corporeality um, of people of the past is, is one way to um, uh, access uh, that knowledge uh, in ways that we don't when we just think of them as documented on a piece of paper. So that would be my very small entry answer, entry point answer to that. Um, but I can't wait to talk to you about this in your class, Salvador. So thank you for that question. Does anybody else want to tackle the question of the body as archive? It's a tough one, I know. <laughs> when I was an undergrad, I made an artist book. Um, I figured out how to make a kind of material that mimicked my skin. And then I like took pictures and or scanned various body parts to show all my scars and stretch marks and, you know, freckles and stuff. And I Did Ashley for, for everyone or just me? Oh, you're back. I'm back. My internet was unstable. Sorry. But um, like in that idea hasn't left me. And then in working with the elders along the way, like I noticed their bodies have been marked by the labor they've done. And labor is what brought them to Baltimore. They're always talking about their work. So I... I don't know, you have me thinking like, you know, industrial branding on, on the human body. Um, one of my former professors, Chris Whitty, who's a really brilliant guy, uh, did work on this too, about like how his father was a truck driver and he had a permanent farmer's tan on just one arm because it hung out the truck window. So I will, and that was published through MICA. I'll find a link to that and send it to you. It might be of interest. Um, when I think about the body as archive, I mean, um, it's honestly, I move through tuition, if through intuition, and um, I can't explain it, but there have been so many times um, walking in Baltimore, um, walking my dog, you know, wh wherever. And I have like a, a eerie feeling or something. It just comes to me. I don't know if anyone else, any other black people feel like this, but you have a feeling. It's like, what is that? Like, and I'm just like, oh, this street is interesting. Let me walk down the street. So I'm looking and I'm like, what is going on? I'm getting like this feeling, this presence. So I go and I'm like, this happened just last week. And I go and I look up the street name and I just typed in black history, Tyson street, boom, immediately history of Tyson street, slaves. I mean, I mean, enslaved people, all kinds of things. And I'm like, wow, like this is like, I'm like, there's no other way I would have known. There's even thought to look this up. You know, and so like it's just a, it's just like something that moved in within me to say like let's go down the street, let me just go and, and and investigate this. But a feeling inside me wanted me wanted to just go and look up the name of the street, 
I just typed in name the street Tyson and, and black history and it popped up immediately. And it's happened to me so many times in Baltimore where I'm just walking down the street and I'll look and I'll just get an intuition and a feeling and I'll, and I'll go and research and, and it'll be some street um, that was um, home to enslaved people. So I don't, I don't know what it is, but I, I definitely feel that body is archive and that intuition, that feeling. And that's how I continue to move th throughout the archive, um, whether it's to continue to research one person or just stop. Um, you know, so I don't know that that intuition that bot, that that the body is archived. I, I I know it's real, and I honestly, it's some some things I just can't I just can't explain. Yeah, I love this question because it reminds me of I did a talk for Regina DeLuise's the body and photography class, and you know I was thinking about how I would research that and how to present it to the students and. It just got me thinking about all this stuff like generational trauma that we hold in our bodies. I just did a session with a therapist for We Here where we were talking about um, trauma in the workplace and how all of that is really kind of held like here, our backs, like for, for by POC. Um, and I was thinking about, you know, uh, how time for me is marked in how I feel both emotionally and in health. Like, I'll be like, oh, that was the year that this happened to me, or like I twisted my ankle at this time. So that's just kind of how I've marked time. And if you think about archives in terms of marking time, like all of those things kind of make sense to me, but I, I hadn't really thought about it until this very moment. So thank you. Yeah, I think that that's um, a really beautiful question to end on. Um, just a note for um, folks as well that um, Kathy highlighted uh, something. Um, Kathy's another librarian, I might uh, highlighted something in our special collections that might be interesting to folks thinking about this question. Um, and you can also see Ashley posted uh, their um, website as well. And yeah, so with that, um, just I would love for everyone to um, take a moment to thank uh, our wonderful panelists for being here and giving us their time and energy and thoughts. Um, and, uh, and I appreciate all of you showing up and asking questions and um, being present here um, today. And um, yeah, I will be in touch with the recording as well. Um, so look out for that. And, um, and please feel free to reach out to me if you have any questions. Um, I will type my email because I think I'm the only person who hasn't done that yet <laughs> in the chat. Um, and yeah, thank you so much, everybody. Um, and I hope that you all have wonderful um, evenings, mornings, wherever you are in the world. <laughs> Bye, everyone. Bye, good night. Thank you so much. Take care, y'all.